So just just 2010. Yeah, this is the first line of the 2010 article. 2010 is a common year that started on a Friday and is the current year. <laughs> so this is an ode to 2010. Okay. Enough. 2010 is a common year. It started on a Friday. Oh yeah. And it's the current year. <laughs> yes it is. In the Gregorian calendar. Now at this part pick it up. Pick it up for the next part. <laughs> Year of the third millennium and of the 21st century. The first of the 2010s decade. The United Nations has designated 2010 as the International Year of Biodiversity. <laughs> yes. In the International Year of Youth. Hello and welcome to the 111th episode of Growing Up Geek, the weekly podcast for geek, entertainment, and nostalgia. My name is Brad, and I am joined as always by my maestro brother, Rob. (laughs) Indeed. (laughs) You are joined by your guitar. I am, and I'm putting it down now because I'll just continue to play it if I don't. Yeah, that's a musician habit. Yeah. Oh gosh, it's annoying, isn't it? And I'm and I'm actively aware of this, but right. You just the college guy crouching on st- on his stairwell, oh, surrounded by girls because he has an acoustic guitar. I always fail to remember the lyrics to that uh, song in Animal House. Right. <laughs> which my girlfriend loves, and she loves that scene, and she always wants me to reenact it because. In reality, I almost did that exact thing. <laughs> I witnessed a dude in a stairwell at your college. I mean, that that was a real event. When it I came it up happens to visit you. all the time. There's a reason yeah. why it's a, that's a classic movie moment because right. everybody's seen that guy and wanted to do that thing. It's that that strong bad thing about circles. <laughs> you know that skinny blonde girl. But you know, yeah. and uh, uh, well, in my case, it was this guy. Um, who was a hippie, Steve, and he just... (laughs) Of course. He lived in in my dorm because I I guess my dorm, for whatever reason, attracted those types. Yeah. And he would normally play when I was fine with that. But then one night, the fire alarm went off. It was a fire drill. Right. So everybody basically is half-clothed, wrapped in their blankets, (laughs) like out in cold weather, just like all standing around because we have to, because they need to make sure this thing works. Yeah. And we're all cranking stuff. And then he's just playing like... Taking full advantage of everybody's lack of being able to go anywhere. (laughs) It's a captive (laughs) audience. So he's just going, oh, of the ages and the circles. <laughs> right. And I walk up to him and just grab the fretboard and just, I don't pull the guitar away from him, <laughs> right. but I just stop him from playing and say, not now. <laughs> yeah, please. These people are scared. Let's My not, roommates let's applauded not. me silently. <laughs> yeah, let's not prey on their fears. Yeah, no, I was at a Thai restaurant once, um, and I witnessed this long table full of Asian men who just decided to take this opportunity. Now, this place was packed, okay? This, like, Asian touring choir or whatever decides to just t- start breaking out a song, and it began with, like, some of the members standing up and going, do, 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 and snapping their <laughs> fingers rhythmically. And then it turns into a full-blown, like, 20-man choir of do, do, like, barbershop quartet style. And you can see the manager, like, sweating in the corner, like... I am going to lose every customer here. And it's one of those yeah. things where it's like, I just wanted to leave immediately. I even said to our guests, like, let's immediately leave. Because this cry for attention stuff, please don't feed into it. You know, don't don't let them win. Yeah, unfortunately, to be a good performer, you kind of have to kill that part of your brain that tells you to stop when it's embarrassing. <laughs> right, so then you, but, 
you've lost that. <laughs> right. So it's great when you're on stage and you no longer have stage fright and can lose yourself in whatever yeah. performance you're giving. But when you're out in public and all of a sudden people want to start singing Rent right. in the middle of Chili's. Yeah. And it's just like, no, it's not appropriate to say these lyrics in this place. How are we going to pay? <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, sir. Well, it's, it's a very raunchy musical, but just yeah. along those lines. Now, I do have to say right. that geeks and music geeks uh, are not the only people guilty of this. How many times have you been to a quiet kind of reserved restaurant like i was at a thai restaurant right yeah and uh out of nowhere this guy just starts like yeah yeah (laughs) yeah yeah because there was a game on on mute on the tv in the corner that he was watching the game and it's socially acceptable apparently to just burst out in applause because a team scored like, yeah, I am not interested in them. I'm interested in my pad thai chicken, thank you. Yeah, well, so speaking of things we're interested in, uh, what have you been interested in this week? Well, once again, it's more Mass Effect 2. Woo! Of course. I, You know, I expected nothing less. Um, This week, I guess the thing that I kind of want to do is, is, is a little bit talk about the comparison between Mass Effect 1 and Mass yeah. Effect 2. Sure. Um, and this is kind of my first kind of con for Mass Effect 2. I, I, I haven't finished it, but I get the feeling I'm pretty much like at the end. Right. And Mass Effect 1 had something that this game lacks, which is uh, something you and I have talked about a lot. Yeah. In that the first game had a really compelling villain. Right. Like a single face that yeah. was the the evil guy, and you were scared of him, and like the people he controlled were also like very powerful, and so if he had them, then oh my goodness! So the first game had very interesting villains, and this mm-hmm. game seems to lack that. Like the villains are kind of cool in right. concept, right. but faceless mainly. Okay. Um. But this game, what is cool is that it does have very good, and I would say better than the first game, heroes. Mm-hmm. The the ensemble of characters you're trekking across the galaxy with are really just, you, you almost feel like they, they couldn't do any better. Is this the three to four guys on the box cover? Yeah, but I mean, it turns out to be like eight people Right. All together, like I was saying, even the the free DLC character they give you, right. who's like the the lowest on you know the effort list. Todd Mustache, exactly. <laughs> Palette swap, reptile blue. <laughs> right. Um, he's really cool, you know. Yeah. And so every other character, other than that, is also really really cool. Like, and and I think it'll be a situation where people are actively debating out of all of these characters who their favorite is oh, cool. because of their their backgrounds because of their relationships i mean even when you encounter a character from the first game mm-hmm. the time span has allowed them to kind of develop even more and so their story's more interesting and so stronger heroes weaker villain exactly and mm-hmm. and on, honestly i i'm wondering if between the two i'd almost take stronger villain over that. Yeah, because that's the the crucial threat element. Yeah. You know, that that's like what is we've talked about Star Wars episode 1 a million times and any time I start I'm like, "Oh, don't let it happen." But uh yeah, the the big problem I think is there's no big threat. You know, it's why people like Darth Maul so much. He adds a, a little bit of threat for a limited time, but overall there's no, you know, there's no Vader. Yeah. I mean, that that's the thing is Saren in the first game was was a sort of Darth Vader character. He was like, holy crap. And and from that right. point, it just got bigger and, and badder and worse. In this right. game, I, I, I kind of don't have a sense of, of villains. And I think sure. because of that, there's there's no real sense of an overarching mission progress. Right. Um, where you feel like you're closing in on this guy or you feel like... Like in from the get go, you're like, well, you could you could go and do this thing, but first, don't you want to assemble your team? I'm like, oh, yeah. I I guess. So the whole feeling, even though this is staying away from RPGs traditionally, right. is that you are essentially just buffing and leveling up 
like in in terms of the narrative structure to take on this final boss or this final mission you know and right it's it's kind of ironic in that sense um but it's cool yeah can i ask you something it, it feels like the week that most of my friends who are playing this have finally sort of encountered or run up against like their annoyance with planet scanning um, I've seen a lot of Twitters and Facebook posts about this, and including yours. Yeah. <laughs> this seems to be something I haven't heard a lot in reviews, but <laughs> one of my friends even said, you know, if this is what they're going to have me do, scan every effing planet, every inch of it, you know, then I'd rather just not play it. Or, you know, it's like, whoa. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of... It's, it's compelling in a way, but okay, so planet scanning, you select a planet in the solar system, you, you essentially fly to it, Right. You close in on it, it'll give you a description of the planet, and then if you push Y, you can scan the planet for elements to mine. Is that necessary? Like, it sounds like everybody's kind of annoyed by it. Well, it's this game's kind of version of grinding, okay. because what you do is uh, the more elements you can get, you can then uh, use that to essentially purchase upgrades, or okay. assemble upgrades using those elements. Right. And... Uh, it's it's cool because all right, if you get enough, you can start to really you know amp up your guy. Mm-hmm. But I, I mean, I've heard that people have played the game pretty successfully without really bothering to mine planets. Oh, okay. Um, you you do get elements on the uh, on the mission, so really right. it's it's an extra mile you can go. But I I'm uh. I am saying like. Between going the extra mile of scanning meticulously the surface of a planet right. and watching, you know, spikes in valleys in, in the in the little meter on the side, right? Um, to driving around a planet in 3D <laughs> yeah. with you know crappy physics, but you know with this Mako thing and kind of right. exploring it for real. Like I'm not sure which one I prefer because the Mako was kind of this crappy like car, but it still like was cool in a way it was like this you were still controlling it and driving around right and and there was an adventure aspect i mean i remember once driving way out and Mm -hmm. coming across life forms on a planet Mm -hmm. which i had not done at all you know like i I was like wow there's there's actually life forms on this planet where so many are just these desolate wastes but it gives the planet's texture it gives them something you can do with them other than just look at them and say oh harvest minerals from them right sure uh like the first game had but i'll I'll say this don't i I don't think you have to do it unless you want to and doing it will give you an edge but i don't think it's critical to do and i i think some people feel compelled to anyway yeah that's good news (laughs) that in the one friend I'm referring to is definitely a Final Fantasy type of guy who he he grinds through you know levels up as much as possible. I'm right. definitely not that person, so glad to hear that. Do you prefer it to the first game? I mean, overall, you were saying this is your first negative thing I've heard about it. You know what? I would recommend it above the first game because I think it's more accessible. Right. But the first game is awesome, and I think this game has done more than other games to stir interest in the first game like even yeah. modern warfare 2 i didn't go back and play modern warfare 1 right uh but i know of a lot of people who for in preparation for this game and even yeah. after playing it went back to mass effect 1 yeah that's exactly what my friends have been doing is playing mass effect 1 i'm like what is all this mass effect 1 in my friends list yeah and it's cool it's, it's also it's available for download so you can just go back and forth real quick and uh, there was a load screen that came up that said the actions you choose in Mass Effect 2 will right. have very stern implications in Mass Effect 3. Oh, there you go. Just, we're putting that out there like, so is this going to get to a point where now Mass Effect 3 comes out and we're going back to Mass Effect 1 <laughs> to make sure right. we got to get that. Well, see, and that's the thing. I was kind of like, almost like criticizing my one friend for playing Mass Effect 1 I'm like you realize that 2 is a big improvement why would you want to go back and subject yourself to all the you know frame rate and Mako and all that stuff and he said I he said I like the idea of a game that does branch the same character across three games you know it does like carry that same story Um, and there are some things that you just miss out on if if you're not playing if you don't play the first one right 
the the second one I hear kind of defaults to like the worst case scenario with yeah. the history of things. Right. That t- like when I run into a character that I played through the whole game in the first one, right. I was like, "Dude, how you been?" you know? <laughs> and he's it's just awesome. all like, "Shepherd." <laughs> yeah. You know, and I'm like, "That's cool. me." <laughs> Cool. Yeah, it sounds, yeah. Sounds like you're uh, continuing to enjoy that. Continuing. Uh, should be wrapping it up soon, I think. And uh, I don't know if I'll play through it again. I'll, I'll say this: there has been an outpouring of people concerning this game and also Heavy Rain, which is um, out now. Right. That have talked about playing through it once and leaving it. You yeah. You know, like that's my story. That's what happened to me. I can swap stories with other people. But right. it's almost too sacred. Like sometimes what you have happen is right. so cool that it's not it doesn't feel right to go back and disassemble it and figure out, okay, well if I do this option It's like that know, was the movie. Option. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Like that that is what happened for you and right. and you should enjoy that. Sweet. It sounds like a good movie or game in general. <laughs> so what have you been uh, cool. up to this week? Yeah, I'm actually going to sort of forfeit my time uh, to oh. save that for the ending because I, I have a nostalgic topic I want to talk about at the end that will take right. a little more time. Um, so I'm going to do that. So let's go ahead and jump right into our super topic this week, which is going to be our most anticipated games of 2010, which we are already kind of well into yeah. at this point. And <clears throat> I, I, full disclosure, we didn't consider doing this show until our our schedules kind of freed up, you know, like we we've, we've been so busy with stuff this year already. Cool stuff yeah. has been happening. We thought we wouldn't get around to actually doing this, so I almost Twitter posted everybody and said, "Hey guys, sorry, there's no <laughs> no mag this year," <laughs> you know. And as it turns out, um, there is. So here it is. <laughs> the structure that we followed last year, if I remember, was three games uh, in order, just basically lowest to most anticipated. Okay. But I do kind of want to get out of the way real quick, just like games that would have been on my most anticipated had it not already come out now. Sure, exactly. All right. Mass Effect 2, yeah. Bioshock 2, right. Dante's Inferno, yes. uh, Aliens vs. Predator, though that turned out to be bad, yeah. um, and just recently released Heavy Rain, which, if you're following me on Twitter, that game is another reason I want a PS3, and you should play Indigo Prophecy. So. Right, exactly. So, yeah, and I sort of feel there. like the exact same way. We've already played some of the, the big titles of this year. I'll go ahead and start and say that my number three most anticipated is going to be the new Prince of Persia game um, that they're working on. It's it's based off of the Sands of Time kind of formula rather than the, the 2008 game, right. uh, which I uh, thoroughly enjoyed. I, I loved that Prince of Persia, and it's the entire reason that I want to play this one, and that might be sacrilegious to some of the fans who are glad to leave that one behind and, and come back to the roots of it. Um, it. It obviously ties in with the movie in terms of time frame of its release, but it doesn't seem like it's going to be directly based on the movie's events, which is kind of cool. Uh, read a preview of this recently and saw that there are now elemental abilities such as water, fire, all that, that you can use, which is going to be kind of cool considering how hyped up we are for The Last Airbender. Um, and the way this works in sort of platforming is you'll leap you know, to, across to like a, a, a geyser of water, you'll freeze it, and then grab it in midair as it's solidified. That sounds solidif- so cool. Yeah, yeah it does. And, and then you'll kind of run up a waterfall. And the, the thing that sounded really great was that you'll be able to do these things sort of like in combo where you are freezing something and then liquefying it again in order to achieve something. And I think that sounds awesome. Um, I have n- really no desire to see the Jake Gyllenhaal version of this, but this game has me excited it's supposed to take place before he got his batitude, you know, before he, as they said on Giant Bomb, became a, a, a Godsmack fan. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't think it's going to deal with that element until the end, you know. So it's, you know, between Sands of Time and the Two Thrones or whatever the two games were. Uh, I'm excited about that. Cool. Um. Well, I guess if I have to start it off, and I, I guess this would be low on the list, mm-hmm. maybe for the sake that it, I'm not sure if it's coming out this year. <clears throat> right. Yeah. But I am looking forward to Natural Selection 2. Okay. I don't uh, even know what that is. Bring it there on. There you go. <laughs> All right. Well, for anybody who's played uh, a lot of Half-Life 2, right. you may or may not have heard of Natural Selection. It's available on Steam. It's kind of interesting. Is it a mod? Yeah, it was a mod. 
Okay. Right? And I think it never really saw a retail version, but there was a lot of uh, buildup about this game. Essentially, what it is, is StarCraft, but from a first-person perspective. Oh, interesting. And where each unit is played by a actual player character. Hmm. Um, you play as Marines versus Aliens. Um, like from the Alien universe? No. No. Okay. It's, it's its own unique universe. But it was a really interesting idea because it, it was melding these ideas <clears throat> of, of like RTS meets first person shooter. So on the human side, right. a player character will take control of a, uh, a command center. Right. And then essentially we'll have to run from an, an above view, mm-hmm. like resource collection stuff. And so if you're a, a, a grunt on the ground, you'll get a command like, go place a resource beacon over here. You right. know, go harvest this resource and, and stuff like that. And so you're trying to do that. Meanwhile, you're keeping an eye out for, for bugs, you know? Yeah. Now, the, the difference being that the aliens are uh, given their orders by an artificial intelligence. Okay. Kind of the idea is that they have a collective hive mind. Okay. So How does that work with player controlling them then? Yeah, that means if one player who's playing like as a as a scout unit mm-hmm. is like hidden and sees human players, suddenly on in the view of all the aliens, they'll be able to see those human characters and where they're located right. on the map. And then they choose to evolve themselves and, and choose what they're gonna be. So like you can evolve and evolve into like essentially what are like hydralisks oh, wow. and you know stuff like that. Whereas the human commander has to issue upgrades. So it's it's this really interesting balance. What platform and is this on? It'll be on the PC. Uh huh. I don't know if it's gonna be on on anything else, but I'm really interested to see. Okay, it's Windows, Mac, Linux, Xbox 360. Okay. Um, and what I'm kind of interested to see is if this it becomes part of maybe another orange box right like of you mods know? like quality this mods is a, this this i believe is now a valve property right which for anything should get us excited about it right but, so then look forward to the brown box in two, in 2010 question mark are you saying it's not scheduled for release in 010 but it's it doesn't, likely it doesn't have a release date but okay. it, it it is listed as being in 2010 well, speaking of something that didn't have a release date, uh, my second most anticipated game is Alan Wake, which I brought up last year <laughs> as an anticipated game of 09, and it never materialized. And a lot of people said it's probably going to be Vaporware. Uh, fortunately, it has a release date now. It's coming out shortly, um, I think in May. It is real. It is created by the people that made Max Payne. Um, it is about this sort of writer in this weird, sleepy, creepy town and uh, it looks a little bit like Silent Hill in the atmosphere. This game looks unique, and that's always something that attracts me to a game. You know, there's so many cookie-cutter games. It, it looks like a game that would have gotten canceled. Well, yeah, it's been in development for as long as there's been an Xbox 360. Right. Like, it was announced alongside Gears of War 1 right. and Halo 3. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's definitely one of my anticipated games. I'm really excited about what it could be. And if anything, they say that the setting of this kind of Alaskan wilderness, right. just small town, yeah. is really well done. And I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, you've got environmental effects where it changes from like fog to night to day, you know. I that's yeah. exactly <laughs> why I want to play this. I don't I don't really care as much about shooting dudes with a flashlight or whatever this game lets you do. People break apart whenever you shoot with a flashlight. Um <laughs> uh, right. make sense of that if you will. But yeah, it's it's the setting I'm interested in. There was an X10 trailer, uh, that Microsoft's X10 event that they they aired, and it didn't show us a whole lot more. But it does have a kind of like goofy moment where a truck like explodes and flips towards Alan Wake, and it hits him, and he just sort of gets bumped by it. Like <laughs> that's either an awesome like ability he has, or it's like a goofus like physics flub. Um, the trailer also ends with him sitting in a chair and saying, "Yes, I'll write." and someone's like controlling him Mm. so i have fears about this game especially if it's focused on the action and it's just another action game i'm going to be really disappointed but if it lives up to sort of the atmosphere uh, looking forward to it so alan wake alan wake how about you number two number two on my list is actually something that was just recently announced so 
if it comes out this year, which it is apparently slated for this year, I'll be surprised and all yeah. the better. Fallout New Vegas. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That trailer. That trailer, which is, that's the thing, is all there is right now is a trailer. <laughs> and it has a robot. And it has War Never Changes. <laughs> <laughs> that's all you need to get Fallout fans yeah, on board. All. Now, th- what I'm excited about, uh, a few more details have emerged about this game. That yeah. kind of just shows, um, I think, that they're they're now willing to move forward with Fallout. Okay. It's it's kind of weird, but if you've played Fallout 1, 2, and Fallout 3, right. you know that they're all kind of the same formula. You emerge from a vault. Right. Actually, you know what? That's a lie. In Fallout 2, you don't emerge from a vault. You're a descendant of the vault dweller. Okay. D- duly noted. <laughs> but it's it's always this um, wasteland, and you know you're kind of a newcomer to the wasteland, so you wander out and you have to discover things. Right. They're switching this up with Fallout New Vegas, and I think it's because people are now like, Fallout Three was such a success; they don't really have to retell the story. Right. In Fallout New Vegas, you're going to be playing as a courier. Oh, okay. Who uh, is you know out in the in the waste and. At the start of the story, something gets stolen from him that's very valuable. Okay. Um, kind of like, I guess, the transporter story. Right. But the, the other big thing and the big reveal in the trailer is that the Vegas Strip mm-hmm. is fully up and running with electricity, hmm. with casinos, yeah. a- a- allegedly, and, and everything. It is a active, lively city. It's not this wasteland right. that Washington or, or the, the right. rest of California is. Right. So that's curious right there. Right. And it's it's kind of like this is this is different. I it's it's a really interesting take and so I can almost see why they wouldn't call it Fallout Four. Right. Even though it's not just an expansion pack. Although it's, it's not almost... Fallout Three New <clears throat> Vegas, right? It's just Fallout. Right. It's just Fallout New Vegas. It... I, I get the feeling it it almost feels like Grand Theft Auto Vice City, mm-hmm. you know that sort of naming it, thing. Is this going to be on e- disc, by the way? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is coming out. It's a full game. Okay. Windows, Xbox 360, wow. PlayStation 3. Um, it's it's the next Fallout game. Hmm. You know, and I, I honestly I don't even know enough to know if this is going to be a first person game. Right. Like it'd be interesting if they go back to the isometric kind of. <laughs> These guys just seem to have <laughs> unlimited creativity. I I love. Um, is it, it's not Bioware. It's Bethesda. Well, Bethesda, but this is being developed by their uh, reliable sidekick, Obsidian. Oh, okay, very cool. You know, yeah, but and, just a uh, cool direction. Like every time that they do a, a DLC or something, I'm always surprised. Every time they do a new, yeah. you know, story reveal, I'm like, oh no, that I wouldn't have thought of. Yeah, they're 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 doing it. They're doing it right. Yeah, yeah. So sweet. <laughs> look for that like later this year. <laughs> uh, that's probably going to be a holiday Allegedly. game if the trailer's out now. Yeah. Of the teaser. Um. Okay. So my most anticipated game of 2010 is Just Cause 2, uh, a game that we've what? talked about. <laughs> a game that we've talked about before. Um. Very kind of uh, sandbox, <clears throat> uh, physics playground style game set in like the jungles. This to me looks like the spiritual successor to Mercenaries 2, which is a game that I love and enjoy heavily with my friends uh, online doing co-op and stuff. And uh, this looks like Mercs Deluxe. It basically takes that same formula and ramps it way up. Um, uh, uh, this trailer shows a guy hook onto a gas tank, shoot it, and ride it up into the sky. Uh, so yeah, it, it's gotten ratcheted up. It's pure violence. It's pure action. Um, you're hooking things to things all over the place. You're hooking a dude to a speedboat, a dude to a jeep. You know, um, almost looks like Gary's Mod, only like a, a legitimate game. It's all set in the jungles, so it looks really good. Lots of lush trees and things. You can pop a parachute out at any time. That is yeah. awesome. And a grappling hook now. Right. Yeah. They, so you can. It's just a button. It's not a equip. Thing. Yeah, you get the sense from this that you can sort of traverse in the quickest way because you can just sort of fly up into the air a million miles, then shoot your grappling hook to whip yourself down to the ground. Um, it really lets you explore this world, it looks like. And some of the stuff in the teaser uh, or the walkthrough, the developer walkthrough, was just unbelievable. Like, you know, I imagine you'll need more practice to do it, but it was like standing on a car while shooting at another car. Super awesome. Um, it also looks like you'll have the um, 
the freedom to sort of do what you want as opposed to like a press A to initiate awesomeness <laughs> kind of a game. A win know? button? Yeah, th there's been a lot of that lately where it's like, you know, God of War style, you know, QTEs and all that, uh, which is fine. But, you know, rather than just si sitting back and seeing something cinematic, sort of like what you said with Mass Effect, play it out your own way. You know, hook yeah. the helicopter to the building or, you know, fly up to the top of the building in a jet and then do your thing. It's that playground of destruction that you love about Mercenaries. Which was the subtitle of Mercenaries. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> on, on PlayStation, yeah. But, but it's, it's the best way to put it, it I'd is. say. It is, and I think that game did a really good job of it, although it was a little bit glitchy and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I, this looks very polished, and uh, I, I cannot wait to try this on 323, March 23rd, is when that's cool. coming out. You know, and I just want to say, if you are interested in that kind of open world destruction, right. you you might want to check out Crackdown Two, which comes out this year. This isn't my top game, right, but sure. just saying yes. Yeah. Um, also, what would maybe be my top game this year? I think was my top game last year. <laughs> nice. Which was Final Fantasy Thirteen. Even though that is officially or unofficially my most anticipated game, because I'm gonna be all over that. Right. My uh, most anticipated game as of this list, and, and I am very much excited about this. Yeah. More so than I think most people are. Dead Rising 2. Oh, wow. Okay. Yes. Coming out August 31st, Windows, Xbox 360, PlayStation 3. Right. You thought I was going to say Epic Mickey, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. We could right. try to get to that, but yeah, go ahead. All right. Sorry. Um. Basically, I'm excited about Dead Rising 2 for the same reason I was excited about Mass Effect 2. Right. Which is that you had this incredibly awesome premise. Yes. That just, it, it had some jankiness that stopped it from being fully enjoyable. Definitely, yeah. yes. <laughs> so, Dead Rising, for anybody who doesn't know, had a terrible save system. Yes. And a, a kind of rigid mission structure. Mm -hmm. And give or take what that it, it adds to its uniqueness ultimately it, it's helped with its demise right so i'm excited to see a second try at this with dead rising 2 slashing down zombies is always going to be fun that was the best and part I, about the first game absolutely oh yeah there's always there's a ton of zombies on the screen you're like how is this even being rendered it, it's almost like this graphical showcase Right. Um, when you look at, at that game, you want to be like, you want to see the difference between Xbox and Xbox 360? Bam. Right. Bazillion zombies. But the other neat thing about this game is that um, you're going to be playing as uh, this handyman. Right. <laughs> something green. I forget his name. Yeah. But you're going to be able to combine items that you find around uh, around Vegas right. to create unique, weird weapons. And yeah. the uh, the two that, that constantly come up uh, involve duct taping chainsaws to the end of a boat oar yeah. and then rowing your way through zombies, yes. like <laughs> slicing them up with this sh chainsaw oar thing that you've created. Right. And then the other one is strapping those chainsaws to a motorcycle and riding through zombies and just yeah. taking them down. The slicicle, as they call it. Yeah. Yeah. I also saw with uh, one with a boxing glove where he taped like a bunch of machetes to it, and it created almost like a Freddy Krueger effect, although there's no fingers Jeez. on a boxing glove. So it's just kind of like slashing Wolverine style through all these. You know, that See, sounds like dumb fun. Yeah, and I'm excited about that because one of the the fun things about Dead Rising 1 was you'd look at like an umbrella and you'd be like, huh, I wonder how I can use this to kill a zombie. Right. I still remember whenever my friends came over to see Dead Rising, I loaded up my save game and I was like totally in my underwear. Like Frank was just in underwear with in one hand like a giant katana and in the other hand a thing of chocolate milk. <laughs> and I was like, this is Dead Rising. <laughs> right. And that's a great thing. And I'm running, slashing, getting covered in blood in my tidy whities chugging the chocolate milk for health, you know? Super cool. That game looked great, too. I, I still have concerns about the look of this new game. Feels like a little bit of a different engine. And the new team, you know, it's not developed by the same team. So that always makes me a tad nervous. But, yeah, uh, if they perfect or improve on what was already there, that's going to be one potent game. Yeah, pretty much all I, I, I need is the first game with a fixed save system, and that'll be beautiful. Exactly, yeah. 
All right, so that is our most anticipated games, our mags of 2010. And, uh, you know, before we close out the show, we always like to get nostalgic. I mentioned that I want to spend a little more time with this one this week, and that's because it's kind of a big one and one that I'm surprised we haven't really addressed before. But uh, we've talked about the Disney Channel and how that was our primary source of kitty entertainment on TV. But one thing we haven't really addressed is the other big channel for our kitty entertainment, which was Nickelodeon. And uh, there's okay. so many places you can go with Nickelodeon that I'm just going to do a stream of consciousness. Uh, I will I will just drop a seed into the conversation and see where this goes, and that seed uh, will be Danger Mouse. I think there's only one line that like stands out for you and I with Danger Mouse. <laughs> right. <laughs> Go ahead. Now you will open the box, Danger Mouse, or I will open your friend, Penfold. <laughs> that was the large frog boss type character. Yeah. And Penfold was his assistant. This was a British cartoon. Yeah, it was imported from the BBC. It was this very weird. I don't even know why exactly we liked it. Right. Um, I don't think we did. That's the thing. No. We've, we've <laughs> gone like, back and watched. Yeah, Danger Mouse was one of those things alongside like Count Duckula, where it was like bad looking. Or like Paddington Bear, where it's like you watch it at your grandma's house. You, you feel depressed. It's gloomy. Like the footage is bad. It's like, this is cartoons for sad people. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Apologies to British listeners. The difference, you know, in quality from American cartoons was relatively obvious to me. I, but, I mean, almost notable. Like, there's there's a difference between that and, and Japanese and, right. and stuff like that. So, yeah. I, and I don't know what it is, but there there were just some freaky things going on with British uh, <laughs> Like I remember yeah. the BFG. Now I don't know if that was on Nickelodeon, but still. Oh gosh, yeah, it's a movie. He, they they seemed oddly comfortable with like child nudity. <laughs> like I remember it, there was that, and then there was like some sort of like strange new worlds or something like that. It was like a a you know cartoon of like a a, a novel, but it was like the weirdest like right. science fiction, and there was like disturbing kind of close to nudity going on. Right. Yeah, BFG, that's the thing where they fart and shoot into the air. It's it's Whiz the, Pop. Whiz Pop. Yeah, it, it's very similar to Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and it's by the same author. Yeah. But yeah. It, it, it was very <laughs> very different in terms of context and and I can say, you know, as a young kid watching a giant eat sleeping children, right. like which is allegedly what happened and like right. <laughs> have to fight you know, the little girl having to fight, you know, uh, nightmares. Yes. Um, like, it's not the best thing, you know. That you, reminds you me of feel... Little Nemo, that anime slash British cartoon, whatever it was. Where the Little Nemo, that was anime. Like the adventures anime. of Little Nemo, yeah. He was yeah. riding on his bed. Speaking of, yeah. like, nightmares, I think that... was that... the same same thing. He, he right. went to Dream World, right. but uh, there was this lord of nightmares that he had to yeah. battle. Yeah. Yeah, there was a lot of things about Nickelodeon that made our parents kind of iffy, kind of nervous, mm-hmm. uh, more more so than the Disney Channel. And mm-hmm. I think it's because it had that whole, like, you can't do that on television, sort of down with parents, up with kids attitude. Yeah. You know, kids rule, milkshakes. <laughs> just... Will Smith being like, parents just don't understand. Exactly. That, that was the sort of attitude of Nickelodeon. And I know that kind of drove mom and dad mad, but uh, n- you can't do that on television. you got to admit they had a point because it featured a dad wearing a diaper. Uh, th- my knowledge of this show, uh, and that was Canadian, by the way, but you had like a dad wearing a diaper, <laughs> whatever that was and then like yeah. kids would be lined up on a firing squad and they would shoot at them or, or or they would say what's your last words you know and then you would hear like canned laughter yeah it was, was like supposed to be this? like a monty python for kids like very much so because it right. had that same sort of art direction at the beginning with like the guy's face right. cracking and and, that, and i was like <laughs> again british feeling but it was canadian I guess. Yeah, apparently nickelodeon imported a lot <laughs> Yes, I doubt they had too much of their own material. Well, I guess later they got more. Well, yeah, I, I get I get the realization now that it, it was kind of like today's Cartoon Network where when, right. you know, Adult Swim started up, they basically had to run with, you know, like Cowboy Bebop and things like that. You know, it, it, yeah. it took a while for Nickelodeon to come into its own, but I think in, in that period of time, we got exposed to a lot of, like, art. And uh, I can remember... Yeah. We were really excited about anime. Yeah. And I think it was because of Nickelodeon. Like, there was some sort of fairy tale story thing. 
exactly. Um, yeah. Saber Riders. We had mom stay up, like get up and <laughs> record it at like five in the morning, because that was when anime was on. Sailor Moon comes on at like four in the morning. Yeah. Pokemon after that. Yes. Uh, Ren and Stimpy was the nail in, in <laughs> Nickelodeon's coffin for us. We yeah. actually were watching this episode while Dad had like coworkers over, like people from his office, including his boss, were, were over at the house for like a nighttime party, and there was. Ren and Stimpy, the episode where they pretend to be babies and sneak into the family's house. And the dad in the episode, like, uncinches his robe. And you just see the two of them, like, Ren and Stimpy on the floor while the dad, like, opens his robe. And you see, like, his holster socks. Yeah. Or, like, <laughs> whatever they are. Like, the strap socks. And he goes, like, bath time. And it just drops to the floor. And it's, like, partial nudity of the mother. And yeah, it was, like, yeah, there no was, like, more Nickelodeon. side boob stuff going on. Sure, yeah. It, like, it, that, that was, that's not for kids, you know? And I, It, it I wasn't in our house. The creator of Ren and Stimpy yeah. didn't want to do a kid's show, but he right. kind of ended up doing it anyway, like, because that was the only thing. Oh, gosh. In America, cartoons are for kids. Unfortunately, that was the case. Yeah, the same guy has done the Tenacious D music videos and, like, online animation stuff that almost always features like actual nudity you know well animated but you know that's right. his his sort of style i mean i think he felt probably you know handcuffed a little bit by being on a kids channel but he squeezed a lot of stuff in there uh yeah. while he was doing it you know taking a whole other side path nickelodeon had uh pinwheel and eureka's castle uh today's special when i'm hanging out with like the most obscure nerds That'll come up, and it'll be like, oh, my God, today's <laughs> special with the mannequin. That's all you have to ever say is, like, the mannequin. Because, yeah, this dude came to life in this mall, and there was the freakiest, like, cast of characters. The, the security guard who was part puppet, part human arms, you know? Saddest face ever. Again, there's a certain sadness to a lot of this stuff, but, like, you know, squinting, wrinkled face with weird mustache. And then the mouse, like this tiny mouse with, again, trembling, nervous <laughs> freaky mouse that was like the friend of the mannequin and the security guard what kind of sadness is this you know? this isn't special at all this is no. terrible no and that kind of stuff is what you, where you dwelled in a darkened mall with a freaky trembling mouse and a security guard and a mannequin that is a child's life in the late 80s early 90s yes they, they also had game shows Lots of game shows. Double Dare. Exactly. Which I, I hate to. I feel like I'm really. Our mom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Once again. No, this is boycotted the boycotted Double Dare. Yeah, Double Dare. They didn't like because there was a a lot of food being wasted. And you know I, what? I don't know that it was real food though. <laughs> that giant peanut butter sandwich may or may not have contained actual giant bread. Somebody just reminded me the other day about the big nose that you would pick. Oh shoot! To get the key out of it. You're just like, That's awesome. Oh. Yeah, kids love you know, boogers. That show did tap into something. There's a reason why that was yeah. popular for kids. Yeah. You know, and Mark Summers was there. Yeah, and then there was the one. Where, I think it was Guts where they climbed the aggro crag. Oh yeah, it was gladiators for kids. Yeah, and and then there was a lot of video game related ones i, I nick think. arcade which has been popularized lately on a youtube clip <sighs> that shows all of the weird what was happening moments of nick arcade where the kids would clearly get the answer right and the host would be like no i'm sorry that's not correct <laughs> or like the green screen stuff where the kid is looking at an image of himself in the video game remember right i remember still wanting to go on that show yeah. And uh, get put inside of a game. Because there were certain challenges that were just stupid. It was like, get 10 rings in Sonic. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they would have actual games, which is kind of cool. And at the end, inevitably what you would win, and maybe this was a different show. No, I think it was this one. You would win a Neo Geo gaming oh, system. Oh, jeez. No, but that's not small potatoes because that sucker was expensive. Oh, yeah. I mean, trust me. Like, if if I were on that show, I would totally take it. But to buy a game for the Neo Geo costs like $200. So whatever they're yeah. giving you is basically it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You're not going to add more to your library. You're giving your parents a reason to spend 200 bucks per cartridge. Yeah. Uh, Nickelodeon. Nickelodeon, ladies and gentlemen. It, it's a nickel-based Odeon mm -hmm. that you put your nickel into and you watch erotic movies in the 1940s and and if you're lucky they're in 3d <laughs> that's that's the channel in a nutshell that's the tv guide Turn synopsis. A hand crank forward a, and backward a hand cranked nickel based erotic film delivery system <laughs> nickelodeon for kids <laughs> mom i understand now 
why you didn't like that. And <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I didn't think parents understand because why wasn't fun just something we do all the time? You don't want to see the world <laughs> actually run by kids? Oh, boy. This is <laughs> Where kids rule. Oh, boy. Like we would take water slides everywhere. <laughs> this is my quick mental image. A fat kid lying in the street on his side with a milkshake pouring out of his mouth <laughs> while someone else shoots shotgun shells at, like, monkeys that are launching around just <laughs> untamed. Kids rule. Kids rule. Uh, yeah. So anyway, that is our show for this week. If you would like to participate in the show and send us an email, you may do so. Our email address is mail at growing-up-geek.com. Also, you can follow us throughout the week on Twitter at twitter.com slash gugbrad and gugrob. That is going to do it. Uh, once again, my name is Brad. Pachamama. We'll see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>